Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey, folks. As many of you know, this project was started out of our frustration with the growing entanglement of Christians with the state. That entanglement includes the majority of Christians turning a blind eye to the atrocities the United States government is committing in other countries. So I invited Scott Horton to come on the show and lay it all out for us. His knowledge of American foreign policy is not like anything I've ever heard. He doesn't mince words about it, and that is something I really appreciate about his approach. Scott, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks very much for having me, Craig. Awesome. Um, so why don't you give us a little background of yourself so people who might not be familiar with you can have a better understanding of who you are? Well, I'm just a typical anti-government extremist type. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a libertarian. I'm from Austin, Texas. And, um, you know, I'm basically like a Ron Paul libertarian. I, uh, I'm the editorial director of antiwar.com, which is not a leftist organization, but a libertarian one. It's been, uh, that URL has been owned by the libertarians since 1995. And, uh, that's 25 years of being right about everything. <laughs> Although I only started working for him in like 2004. So I'm not trying to take credit for all of that. And then I'm the founder of the, and director of the libertarian Institute with the great Sheldon Richmond and also Pete Canones, who's a great new libertarian who's been, you know, making a big name for himself for the last few years. And uh, Kyle Anzalone, who's another great foreign policy expert who also works with us at antiwar.com. And uh, I wrote a book called Fool's Aaron, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, which started out as chapter two of my book about all the terror wars. And it ended up growing into an entire book. And so, now I'm about to put out a new book, which is the one I was trying to write in the first place there where I got carried away on chapter two. And it's called Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And it basically covers everything from Jimmy Carter through right now. That's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. you, you mentioned Pete. I, that's actually how I got in touch with you because I was trying to find a way to get in touch with you on, through your website and I couldn't find a way to contact you. And I shot him a message and he responded, I emailed you and you responded immediately. And I really appreciate how quick that happened. Sure. You mentioned uh, what I had, uh, you mentioned you're from Austin, Texas. I'm originally from Texas myself. And I heard Benji Graves on your show and I had him on and I told him while listening to you, I said, I can catch Scott's Texas snark pretty quick. And I spent a lot of my time just laughing at you through, through your show because of this, because you're really snarky throughout it. And it, I get all of it. And I, I even mentioned that to Pete one time too. I said, I think New Yorkers and Texans are a lot alike, except for our dialects. He said he catches that a lot with you as well. It's funny. Cause you know, I always thought when I was a kid, my parents are not from Texas. Um, and you know, they're both kind of from everywhere. Um, and I just grew up watching so much TV. I, you know, and you know, some of my neighbors were generations deep Texans, but many of them were not. And I always thought I didn't really have much of a Texas accent, but that's not what other people say about me. So I guess. <laughs> well, I always tell people that we don't have accents. Everybody else does. Right. There you go. You guys are talking all wrong. <laughs> there you go. All right. So one of the main reasons I wanted to get you on, and we can talk about Iraq and Afghanistan as well. But we talk about Yemen quite a bit on the show, and my knowledge of Yemen is very limited. And what I do know about Yemen is what I've learned from you or learned from listening to you and, and other shows like yours. But I need I want what I was, was hoping for you to do is to just lay it out and don't don't hold back and just kind of no holds barred about what's happening, because I've heard you describe what's the war in, in Yemen is designed to inflict famine. And I think Christians need to understand this because they'll, they'll run to the polls and they'll vote for the guy, whether it's a Republican or Democrat, whoever their, their side is. 
as a Christian and they turn a blind eye to what's going on over there. And the more I've learned about what's happening on there, it's just become increasingly more disgusting to me. And I don't think Christians really understand or I don't know if they want to understand what's going on over there because it really would come into conflict of how we were supposed to behave as Christians or, or you, t- you take the words of Jesus and how he, what he taught goes against everything that we as, or as Christians are supporting the United States government doing, or they're just turning a blind eye to it because they don't want to admit to the atrocities and they are more worried about what's going on here in their, in their own personal lives. But we are, we are wrecking people's lives daily in other countries and we let it go unabated without even trying to stop stop it. We just keep encouraging them to do it. And it's really becoming more frustrating. This is probably the, one of the most frustrating aspects of Christians and their involvement with the state for me personally, because it is, like I said a while ago, it's, it's just completely disgusting to me. And I, I can't even fathom what's going on over there. But I want you to lay it all out for us and if I got something to interject or ask while you're talking, then I'll, I'll stop you. But why don't you tell us what's happening, how we got started in Yemen and why we're in Yemen. If there's a, if there's no reason that I can come up with why we're in Yemen, but why did we get there and how did we get there? Okay. So is it okay if, first of all, I talk about the, the kind of culture war aspect of what you're just mentioning there about like, yeah, you know, as far as like cleaning house inside uh, Christian movements in America, that's your business. But I mean, I'd like to address, I think, you know, part of, of, you know, what's at play there. And I think it's pretty simple, but I think it's pretty easy to diffuse too. You know, I mentioned I was a Ron Paul guy before. Right. And, you know, I love everything about Ron Paul, but what was it that he did that changed the world? What was it that he did that was so important? And what it was, was he said, look at me, I'm a white guy, Methodist, still married to my first wife, little old country doctor, Republican Party congressman from Texas, the most conservative member of Congress, according to every scoreboard on gold, on guns, on taxes, on everything. And I say, you can be anti-war as can be. Look at me. And if you want to be anti-war, you can be anti-war too. And if somebody had given you the impression that you have to sign up with Jane Fonda and Michael Moore and become a communist and hate America in order to be anti-war, then that was misinformation. You might have been confused and thought that that was right. But in fact, you could be anti-war just like me. And look at Ron Paul's character. And he's every one of those things I I said in a very little literal way. If people aren't familiar, the man's just not a politician. He's not a lawyer. He's a doctor and he's just a decent man. And he really is married to the same woman that he's been with since they were 16 years old and is really like that, you know, American Gothic, not in any cynical, sarcastic way. He is, you know, that quintessential, uh, decent human, Mr. Smith goes to Washington sort of character that people can really trust, you know, so he's always been. And he goes, look, on the scale of things, you might call me a right winger. And by the way, you know, in 2012, he was the only vet in the race. And he was the one who was absolutely as anti-war as can be. And I think a lot of what you're talking about with why you're so frustrated with Christians not being anti-war, even though if they're listening to the Gospels and you pick and choose which ones say what, but, you know, Jesus didn't say anything about we ought to support the empire at war, right? We all know that. Um, But it's all caught up in the culture war, right? Again, Michael Moore and Jane Fonda, and for that matter, Janis Joplin and tie-dye and, you know, groovy day-glow bubble letters from 1967 and 68. These things are all still stuck to the anti-war movement. It's just like on The Simpsons where if anybody smokes pot, they start playing Get on the Peace Train from 1967. Like there's nothing to pot culture that has taken place (laughs) since the dirt weed of the late 60s, right? It's the same thing with the anti-war movement. Somehow we're still stuck with Jane Fonda, you know? But the reality is that it should be, and it is uh, in a great many minds, perfectly reasonable and responsible and correct 
for conservatives and libertarians and patriots and capitalists and veterans to be anti-war, to see through this complete ruse, this, you know, false narrative that has us at war for 20 years in a row now to hunt down 400 men. We all know something is wrong here. Everybody knows that. And I think a huge part of the reticence that you talk about it's not about the facts. It's not about lay out what we're doing in Yemen. It's about, wait a minute, does that make me a Nancy Pelosi liberal namby-pamby? Right. If I care about that? Or is that a good conservative, patriotic, right-wing Christian thing to care about Yemen? And it's the way that we come at these things. If you attack the right from the left, they just armor up. You attack the left from the right, they just armor up. When you meet people where their principles are, Here's a, an important conservative American principle that Christians believe in, keeping the Constitution of 1787 and not letting it go to the ash bin of history as what happened with the communists and all of the, that's what they say about every fallen and failed system, right? Well, how are you going to keep that Bill of Rights? How are you going to keep a Constitution that describes a limited federal republic when America is a world empire? One thirty trillion dollars in debt. One with a police state that makes our Bill of Rights null and void and everybody knows it on the federal, state and local level and all points in between. So that's it. So that's the deal, you know, for, for one major American principle. If you want to keep your republic, you have to abandon the empire. And if Ron Paul can do it, then so can you. I'm really glad you brought up Ron Paul because I, I wanted to talk about that a little bit, too, because... In my transition, and I didn't tell you this before we started recording, you don't know nothing about me. Like we've jumped right into this. So back in 2000s, first time I got involved with politics at all. And I started my, I was a one issue voter. I, and it was all about abortion. So I joined the Republican team because they were speaking to it. And the day after 9-11, I turned into a full fledged card carrying neocon. And I lasted that for, I was that way until 2016 and well, a little bit past 2016. It went, cause when Trump was nominated, I started losing interest in the Republican party and started seeking out like a third party option and got into libertarian circles. I was one of those guys that was booing Ron Paul off the stage when he was in the debates. Cause I like, this guy's not unpatriot or, he, or he's unpatriotic. He's not supporting our troops, but it never dawned on me during this whole time. And once I started understanding libertarian philosophy, it never dawned on me up until then that, hey, maybe these folks are pissed off at us because we're dropping bombs on them every day. They don't hate us because of our freedoms, as George W. Bush told us. I bought into that garbage, too. No, they hate us because we're killing them. Yeah, they hate us because of Bill Clinton. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, doesn't that sound reasonable? In fact, you know, I wish I could figure out a way to do this without, you know, like, being too gimmicky or stupid about it or whatever, but uh, in the book, I, you know, I attack from Jimmy Carter all the way through. I have no regard for any president. I don't favor any of them, any secretary of state, any of these people I mentioned, you know, it's all just facts. I don't favor any of them, but um, I'd like to be able to say to right wingers, look, you know, you love your country. You love your infantrymen, right? Okay. You love your flag and, and your mom and all that. But if Bill Clinton is the president, then your country could make bad decisions, right? <laughs> your country could do the wrong thing because look at who we're talking about here. If it's say you just have such a soft spot for George W. Bush somehow or the Republican Party somehow. <laughs> OK, fine. Look at the history of Jimmy Carter through right now and just pretend it was Jimmy Carter and he did three terms and then it was Bill Clinton and he did four terms, and then it was Barack Obama, and he did three, and now we're going into the Biden era. <laughs> you know, conservative Christians out there, we've been stuck with these Democrats you can't stand since 1979. There was no Reagan, there was no Bush, there was no, you know, pressure valve for your, you know, tension and disgust at this state. It's been nothing but Bill Clinton making these decisions the whole time. Not your country, Bill Clinton the face-biting rapist, the butcher of Waco and Kosovo. Wow, guess what? He did the wrong thing. This is the guy who supported Al-Qaeda in Bosnia where Khalid Sheikh Mohammed that did 
earned his stripes as a Mujahideen warrior. He was late to the war in Afghanistan. He didn't earn his credibility until he fought for Clinton in Kosovo. That's the Bill Clinton we're talking about. Now, if Bill Clinton does something, do you have to defend it because of patriotism? Do you have to defend it because of your reverence for your average Marine Corps, you know, sergeant? Come on. Right wingers accuse liberals of being emotional and not logical. You know, well, let's be grown ups about this. Might a lousy president like Bill Clinton or Barack Obama send a good soldier on a fool's errand? It shouldn't be, you shouldn't have to have like a panic attack over that. You know what? The wars are all corrupt and wrong and based on lies. Everybody knows that. Stop being childish. This is a corrupt, evil empire. It has been at least since World War II. What's the point of pretending that's not true? America's killed a Holocaust worth of people since World War II. More. Why ignore that and say, well, yeah, but I'm from here. Hey, look at you and me. We're Texans. So we have to pretend that every president we had was some angel when he made the horrible decisions he made to kill the people he killed. I'm just not for that. And you know why I'm not a veteran? Because Bill Clinton was the president when I turned 18. And all, all kids, when they're leaving high school, consider whether they're going to join the military or not. I never seriously considered it. But he is the main reason that it wasn't even an option for me. How could I believe that I was serving my country when Bill Clinton was going to send me to Bosnia to take the side of the Mujahideen? It's the same thing for Reagan and Bush and Trump, too. That's just true. There's no point in being emotional about it. Ronald Reagan supported the Mujahideen in the 80s, supported Saddam Hussein. George W. Bush killed two million people fighting a war for Iran that he hated because he was stupid. That's the reality of it. Why should that hurt anybody's auntie's feelings? Like, oh, he's talking bad about Bush. What was Bush other than Bill Clinton? And what was Bill Clinton other than George Bush Sr. before that? It's all the same difference, man. I agree. And that's actually one of the benefits of being a libertarian or even for people who are socialists or far right-wing populist, you know, patriot movement types is if you're not a partisan, then that's easy. You know, there were right-wingers in the 90s who said that the problem with Bill, I mean, real right-wingers, very right-wingers, who said that the problem with Bill Clinton was that he was the secret agent of H.W. Bush that they all sold cocaine together in the 1980s during Iran-Contra and that the Republicans stepped aside so the Democrats could get NAFTA passed. But nobody thought the boy from Hope was in charge. H.W. Bush is the cousin of the Queen of England. He's the bluest blood. He's from the height of the, Amer the old American WASP establishment. Bill Clinton is not even new money, right? He's just a new politician from a southern state who was made, and there were right-wingers who understood that. Not, the problem with Bill Clinton wasn't that he was a communist. The problem with Bill Clinton was that he was a corporatist who worked for the same people that Bush worked for. And that was my introduction to politics in the 1990s. There's no fooling that, that Bill Clinton was some kind of leftist, but just because his wife is so annoying, that doesn't make him a communist. I and mean, look at his policies. Oh, he's a warfare state, national security state guy from beginning to end. No different than the Bushes that came before and after him. Do you see, before we get into what's happening in Yemen, and I, I want to say something, speak to something you just said too, because you said the reason you didn't go join the military is because Bill Clinton was the president at the time. I tried to sign up, me and a buddy from church tried to sign up for the National Guard. I lived in Arkansas for 25 years before moving to Tennessee. Now, and I, we tried to sign up for the National Guard right away. He got, he got selected. I couldn't get in because I was four pounds overweight. But my reasoning was, and I told my mom this too, and I, I remember this. I remember this so crystal clear. I said, I would be honored to fight for somebody like George W. Bush. That's, that's the mindset I had back then. And I've come this far from there. Right. And, and I, listen, as a libertarian, I've always, I've never been prejudiced about this. Any right winger who looks at the left and says, well, that's why I'm a right winger because I'm definitely the opposite of that. Well, I can understand that. But the vice versa is also true. 
Yeah. Any decent person who looks at the right and says, well, I'm definitely not that, so I must be this. There's plenty to criticize on the right. A good person could make that decision just as well the other way. And I always agree because I hate both sides so much or disagree with both sides so much. <laughs> and I can agree with both sides a lot, too, about what they say about each other. I mean, most of the time they swing and they miss because they don't know what they're talking about. But a lot of the times, you know, there's at least real reason to not be on the side that you're not on. You know what I mean? Right. And it, you just kind of got to open your eyes to it. I, I think that's another frustrating side for me because there's so much wrong going on, but people will not recognize it because their team is in, in a certain position they are in, in power. You know, there's this great quote from a guy named Carol Quigley, who was Bill Clinton's professor at Georgetown University uh, back in the 60s. And he's the author of the famous book. It's, it's famous on the populist right, Tragedy and Hope. It's kind of a real-time revisionist history of the first half of the 20th century by Carol Quigley. And, well, it's hard to give the whole context here, but anyway, the point is, he says, listen, the only reason why there should be a two-party system where one party represents the interests of the liberals and the other of the conservatives is so that the two sides can, and then his ironic quotes, throw the rascals out every eight or even four years, if necessary, then we can bring in a new team to accomplish the same basic policies. And so half the time you're really mad because it's Bill Clinton or Barack Obama, but the other half of the time you got somebody in there you can cheer for. And that essentially, you know, why just beat you over the head when we can give you a Soma pill, you know? And so that's basically the deal. And that's what you get with the the switch off in the parties in America. But then, and he even lists, he goes, look, we all know what the real deal is. And then he lists things that have nothing to do with the constitution. There's no article one, section eight. He goes, look, we all know what the responsibility of the federal government is. It's to make sure inflation is going, but not too high and make sure to keep our Atlantic Alliance strong with Europe. And you know what I mean? It's all just the agenda of the liberal establishment, the post-World War II liberal establishment. And that no one's going to question that from Truman to Eisenhower to Kennedy to Nixon to whoever. The, these things don't change. It's almost like they planned it that way. Well, it's a lot of power. You know, um, you might have seen this clip and I don't want to be too prejudicial against this because there's actually a couple different points here. But there's this clip going around of this powerful Chinese counselor guy, somebody giving a speech explaining how that. Whenever we've had a problem with the Americans, we could always smooth it over real easy. Why? Because we got these great connections on Wall Street. And if there's a problem, we call them and then they call D.C. and smooth it over. But now with Donald Trump, he didn't have a good relationship with Wall Street. He basically owed them a bunch of money. The guy says it politely, but they hated him and he hated them. He was from Queens, right? He was new money, white trash to them. They hated him. Um, he wasn't, you know, to a Texan, he was from New York City. But <laughs> to the people in New York City, he was from Queens. He was not from New York City. You know, he was, or not from their New York City. You know, anyway, so he was not a Wall Street guy. You know, people said he was a fascist. It's like, well, if he's a fascist, where is his faction? He's got no faction. The fascists in America support the Democrats and the Republicans, but not this guy. I mean, he's not one of them. He doesn't represent a specific group of hedge funds or investment banks or anything like that. He never did. They hated him. But anyway, so then this guy says, well, look, you know, we essentially threw our weight around and did what we could to help and get rid of this guy. So it's interesting there because he's, you know, what he's showing is still the overriding control of the government by New York financial interests. On the other hand, though, too, he's showing how capitalism can really help to smooth over political problems. Frankly, I'm on the side of Wall Street and the Chinese in this one. You know, he the guy lists a few examples, including when the spy plane got shot down in the early Bush years, early Bush Jr., 2000, spring 2001. And Colin Powell got on the phone with the Chinese and said, you know what? We're sorry about that. We didn't mean to crash a plane in your thing and the thing, and maybe we work out a deal. And treated it nice. And why do you do that? Because billions of dollars are at stake. That's why. And Murray Rothbard said, where goods do not cross borders, soldiers will. And in fact, I just um, learned this great uh, Alexander Hamilton quote where he talked about 
uh, commerce being the great healer of bad humors <laughs> or some kind of thing like that, where hey, if we got to do business to with each other, even if we don't like each other, we have to not fight so that we can keep doing business. Well, good, because fighting is bad. And especially talking about a rising new power that has H-bombs that, you know, essentially could destroy our civilization in an afternoon. And the fact that we would destroy their civilization in the same afternoon would be not much consolation. And so, you know, by all means, we should be keeping tensions with the Chinese at a low ebb. And it's fortunate in this instance that our financial establishment does intervene and prevent the... Um, you know, the, the war hawk types and the, the, just the politicians with political interests at stake from doing the wrong thing too much. In fact, this is the problem in the Middle East, right? Because we hardly had any trade. Everybody had been under sanction for so long that no American powerful corporation had anything to lose from attacking the Middle East. You know, the oil companies, they're still fine in Arabia, enjoying, you know, artificially high oil prices that kind of thing. I guess Pepsi lost some exports to Egypt and to Iraq where they used to drink Pepsi. You know, they're not allowed to drink alcohol there. So they drink a lot of soda and they quit drinking American brand soda. But that's about it. But if only we had had billions and billions of dollars at stake, maybe someone would have put a leash on George W. Bush and told him, no, you can't do this. Instead, where were the billions? The billions were at stake in starting the war and selling the weapons to the American government to wage the war with. And so, you know, where a war with China would be an absolutely bankrupt losing proposition all the way around. A war in the Middle East is bad for a lot of people, but it's really good for a few. Right. Hey, folks, Craig here. And I'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog. I don't care if you have any experience or not. Two or three of our contributors had no prior experience writing, and it turns out they have a real knack for it. Our project coordinator helps them put the articles together, and she publishes them on our website and Facebook page, and you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in depth about your article. So if you like what we're doing at The Bad Roman and would like to try your hand at writing, then send us an email at thebadromanpodcast at gmail.com. We're having a blast with this project, and we would love for you to join us in helping promote it. Now back to the show. I want to touch back on something that you, you mentioned, Biden. And we can talk about Yemen, too. I didn't mean to dodge that question. <laughs> no, no, dude, you're good. You're good. Because we're fixing to get into that. But I got a couple questions, and we'll get into Yemen. You mentioned Biden. Do you? And there's two parts to this. With Biden, do you see anything changing? Do you think it's going to get better, worse, or stay the same? And this is something that I hear from other libertarians quite often, a lot. I, I don't vote anymore, but people are trying to convince me I should vote for a libertarian because they are convinced that if a libertarian was to somehow win the presidency, that all of this would go away. Do you agree with that? Or do you think it would just stay the status quo? Well, it depends which libertarian and how brave they were and how well they understood the situation, and how bad they wanted it to get done. But if, look, if a libertarian president won, it would be because a libertarian convinced population of America said that they had absolutely had enough. I mean, you're talking about an absolute political revolution where the libertarian party candidate blows the Republican and the Democrat away. Now you're talking about the people of America versus power in Washington, D.C., and they don't have any choice but to obey all of us if it comes to something like that. And the best thing, the reality is the best thing we can get out of a libertarian presidential campaign is a really good speaking tour on behalf of peace and liberty. That's what Ron Paul did. You know, we knew they were going to cheat him out of Iowa. We knew they were going to do everything that they could to make sure that Ron Paul couldn't win. On one hand, he could have won if the American people at large had decided, hell yes, let's bum rush the primaries and make sure that this guy is the guy. Well, that could have happened and they wouldn't have been able to stop it. But that didn't happen. It was basically still a contest within the Republican Party. And so it was marginal. When he did win, it was barely, and it was close enough for them to cheat him out of it. But what did we get? We got a great speaking tour on behalf of peace and liberty. And that's the best thing that we could hope for with another Harry Brown style type libertarian presidential campaign is somebody having the chance to say, look, guys, the problem isn't this. The problem is this in a way that 
Americans at large can hear and understand. I had somebody tell me one time, and I've learned a lot from him, but he said he's a big fan of Ron Paul, too. He said that if the if the right was really concerned with small government, with the United States Constitution, they would have voted overwhelmingly for Ron Paul because in his, his voting record alone, he voted, I think it was something like 99, almost 100 percent of the time with the United States Constitution. You know what? It was bad timing, though, too. On one hand, I mean, don't get me wrong. 2008, I'll never forget it. What a beautiful year that was. Seven and eight. It was just incredible, the Ron Paul revolution. And 12 was great, too. But, you know, seven and eight, it was magnificent. But look, it was at the end of the Bush years. And man, the Republicans were just in such denial. They could not admit how horrible he was and how horrible they had been to go along with it all. It was just too soon. So Ron Paul was running against the legacy of the sitting president of the same party. It was the same problem that Bernie Sanders had running against Barack Obama's legacy. It's like, well, what do you mean Barack Obama sucks? You want to succeed him in his same party. You know what I mean? It's a difficult position to be in politically. And so this is what happened with with um, the Republicans then. And then four years later, when he's running against, well, see, this is a primary contest, too. But, you know, with Obama in there, he didn't have a prayer either way, even if he'd gotten the nomination. He, he certainly couldn't have uh, beaten Obama. But even in 2012, back to the real point there, the, in, the Republican Party still was not willing to admit that the reason everybody hates us is because of George Bush and our support for him and the horrible war. So they nominated Mitt Romney, who said we ought to double Guantanamo and kill more terrorists. And Barack Obama's killing people all day, every day. And to Mitt Romney, it's never enough. You know, he wants to be like John McCain which is, you know, on whatever, whoever Barack Obama is killing, it's got to be 15% worse than that. And, and so that was who they nominated and that was why they lost. But that was, you know, it wasn't just the party bosses and it was, but it was the people too, the voters too. You know, with, with the advent of Joe Biden coming in, which was your question about Biden, I see right wingers saying, oh, great, he's going to sell out Israel and kowtow to the Ayatollah and to Beijing. And it's like, no, he's not either. Joe Biden is the most Zionist. You know, you could call him an agent of a foreign power, essentially. I mean, he has been nothing but a servant of Israel his entire career. They unearthed a thing where in 1983, he said, geez, if the Israelis don't stop expanding the settlements, we might have to cut off some of their aid. And they found that and they go, what's up with this, Joe Biden? You said this in 1983 and he just lied and denied it. I never said that. Never. Not even back the year Return of the Jedi came out. You know, like, no, this, <laughs> this is, uh, I'm, that's a, that New York Times report is a damn lie. He said, um, and he means it. If he could go back in time, he would have never said that at all. He, there's, you know, and then kowtow to the Ayatollah, what, by not starting a war? Well, then that's what Donald Trump has just spent four years doing, too. I mean, if he means the Iran nuclear deal, then he doesn't know anything about it because the Iran nuclear deal isn't kowtowing to Iran at all. The Iran nuclear deal is Iran kowtowing to the United States of America in a hundred ways and none back the other way. And as far as Beijing, again, I prefer peace with Beijing than a trade war and brinksmanship and Obama's and Hillary's policy of a pivot to Asia and trying to build up this new, you know, economic and military alliance against them to contain them and hem them in. You know what? It was Americans, Milton Friedman and Richard Nixon, who told the Chinese, you guys have got to give up communism. That's why you're going hungry all the time. And, and Mao finally died, and Deng Xiaoping said, you know what, that makes sense. <laughs> so this is before I was born. This is in 1975, 70, you know, 74, 75. And so it's the Americans that told the Chinese, stop being Marxists and start being Chicago school guys, right? Which means essentially conservative corporatists, not real free market, but a more or less free market, property rights, prosperity for your people. Now they have some, and now America wants to say, oh, no, China's going to take over the world. But come on, 
I mean, you don't have to know anything about the history of China to know that China's never had an interest in taking over the world ever. In fact, somebody told me this story, how they built this gigantic fleet and they sent it all around to the Indies and to Africa and to India and wherever. And they came back and said, it sucks out there. We hate it. And so they essentially <laughs> had built their little wall and had an isolationist leave us the hell alone culture for 2000 years until the Americans dragged them out of it. And the British with a gun to their head, um, you know, we should be happy for that. And, and yes, it's true. They're building up their naval forces, but even the Americans call it anti-access area denial. In other words, they're building up a defensive naval force because America is building up our offensive naval force against them. And based on what? Based on this hypothetical that what exactly? They're just going to overrun Japan and Korea and Hawaii as long as we're just making up stuff, you know, how about L.A.? I don't know. <laughs> right. you know it's, it's not, there's no reason to – everything that they're doing is a reaction to America's policy in the Pacific. It's as simple as that, which is based – it's essentially it's like the British in World War I, just absolutely terrified that the Germans are going to have dominance in Central Europe. Well, guess what? Germany is – just by shape on the map, it is the dominant force in Central Europe. What are you going to do about it, England? Just, I guess, get 100 million people killed or something like that, you know? Okay. <laughs> that was a lot to digest, but that's cool. Usually, usually whenever I listen to your show, I... Uh... I go back and listen to it a couple more times because I always feel like I missed something. I'm going to do the same thing. Yeah, the interviews of me are even worse, man. <laughs> it's all good. All right, so there's a couple aspects of Yemen. It's, it's why we're there. And I, there's another thing that people, when I mention it to them, I get, they look at me, they just have this blank stare. When I tell them that, do you understand that we are supporting al-Qaeda in some of these war efforts? And they don't believe any of that. What I'm saying, it's happening in Syria, from what I understand. It's happening in Yemen. So what got us involved with Yemen? I know you always talk about Saudi Arabia. Is that how we got involved with it? Because of them? Yeah. Okay, so, yes, we're back in Al-Qaeda. And the reason why is because they're fighting against the Shia. And the Shia, supposedly, in Yemen, are aligned with the Iranians. And the American government hates Iran more than they hate Al-Qaeda. Now, Iran didn't attack us and knock the towers down. Their allies, Hezbollah, didn't attack us and knock the towers down. The Houthis in Yemen sure as hell didn't have anything to do with it. Right. Okay? It's Al-Qaeda that attacked us. But, and, and, you know, as long as I'm on this tangent, none of the 9-11 hijackers were from Iran, Iraq, or Syria. And the Iranian, Iraqi, and Syrian governments had absolutely nothing to do with that whatsoever. Right? Uh, and yet they were our enemies chosen for the war. And, but who did attack us? It was guys from countries that our government supports, Saudi Arabia and Egypt primarily. And why do they hate us? Because we support their governments. Sort of like if Saudi Arabia was supporting Barack Obama in power, we hate them for that. You know, same kind of thing. And, and look at how the Democrats react when they pretend to believe that Donald Trump is supported in power by Russia. Or how right-wingers react when they pretend to believe that Joe Biden is in power, you know, at the behest and under the control of the Chinese. Well, how do you think they feel when it's actually true that our government really is the reason that they live in a totalitarian military police state like in Egypt or a royal dictatorship like in Saudi Arabia? And so that was why they targeted the United States. How can they overthrow their governments? If their governments have the eight trillion ton gorilla standing behind them, the United States, to help support them. And so that was what all of that was about. And, you know, I know it's a lot to ask people to learn the Sunni Shia lines, but I mean, it's, it's really not that much. It just sounds like it is. But the Ayatollahs in Iran are, that's the Shiites. Because of George Bush, now, Baghdad is also controlled by the Shiites, the Iranians' best friends, because George Bush is an idiot and fought a war that he didn't want to fight. And then ever since then, 
they have a policy called the redirection. And I love mentioning this. I really hope people will read it. Read it twice. You might, you know, it might have trouble reading it because of the tears in your eyes from laughing so hard. When you read these people say that it's perfectly reasonable for America now that they realize their mistake in backing the Iranian side in Iraq, that now they're going to tilt back toward Al Qaeda. Because they're tilting back toward the Saudis, our friends, the Saudis. Sorry, Saudi king, for putting, for, you know, helping the Iranians take over Baghdad. <laughs> we mean, yeah, you know, what can we, how can we make this up to you? Oh, support Al Qaeda in Libya and in Syria and ending up with the war in Syria leading to the rise of the Islamic State. Oops. Now that was a huge, essentially embarrassing backfire. And so then they had to fight Iraq War III again on the side of the same Shiite militias they wish they hadn't have fought Iraq War II for in order to destroy the Islamic State again. That was the war that Obama started and Trump finished 2014 through 17, Iraq War III there against ISIS, against the Islamic State. We still have troops there fighting the Islamic State. So the Americans, essentially, George Bush scored a huge own goal because he listened to Cheney and the neocons and the Israelis, and he's stupid. And then he decided to improve upon that mistake by backing al-Qaeda as a correction. And then Obama picked up that policy from Bush. He's not a secret Muslim terrorist. He's a Republican. And he picked up that policy from Bush and he quadrupled the thing, man. He followed it through to the nth degree in Libya and Syria. That's what created ISIS. Trump was right. Obama's the founder of ISIS. No question about it. No question about that. And then he is also the guy who destroyed him again. So why are we fighting in Yemen? Because the Saudis are mad because a group of Shiites who are nominally allied with Iran, but are not really the sock puppets of Iran or anything like that. But they took over the capital city in 2015. And so the Saudis said to Barack Obama, we want to start this war. And Barack Obama said, the American people are at your service, your royal highness. And started the war. And you mentioned that it's a war for Al-Qaeda. People have heard of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. They're the guys that bombed the USS Cole in the year 2000. They participated in organizing the September 11th attack. The uh, one of the hijackers that one of the Flight 77 hijackers, his father-in-law ran the Al Qaeda switchboard house in Yemen, where they passed the messages back and forth from Al Qaeda in Afghanistan to the guys in Europe and America. The, these are real Al Qaeda guys. They did the Charlie Hebdo attack in France in 2015. But this war is not the war against them. This is the war for them. And I'll break it down as fast as I can. It started out as the war against them, 2009. Barack Obama comes into power. George Bush had done a few drone strikes there and had done a couple special ops missions and was paying the dictator there to fight al-Qaeda, supposedly. But it was minimal compared to what Obama did. Obama comes in, he launches a massive CIA drone war. I don't want to kidnap these guys and jail them in secret torture prisons. I just want to vaporize them with 500-pound bombs. So we'll just do that. And... So he sends the CIA to bomb the hell out of Al-Qaeda. They're down in the south of the country, okay? But he's got to bribe the dictator, Saleh, that America supported since 1990. And he's got to bribe him with money and guns in order to let us kill the Al-Qaeda guys. But he takes the money and guns and he uses them to attack the Houthis, this group of Shiites up in the north of the country, his political rivals and enemies. And he ends up backing Al-Qaeda guys and Muslim Brotherhood guys to fight them. And then actually parentheses, not to confuse anybody, but I just love it. He also was arming his enemies, the Houthis, to wear out his own army and his own allies in the Muslim Brotherhood because he didn't want them getting too powerful either. <sighs> you think American politics is backstabby? I mean, this is crazy. Anyway, so every time, and maybe because he keeps arming his enemies, every time he attacks them, he loses. And the Houthis get more and more and more powerful every time he attacks them all through the early Obama years. 2009, 2010 into 2011. At the same time, Obama and the CIA are doing, I promised to do the fast version, right? Obama and the CIA are doing the anti-Al-Qaeda war, but with every bomb they drop, they recruit more and more and more people to Al-Qaeda. And it's just like pouring blood on a terrorist garden. You know, they just grow more and more and more terrorists with these drone strikes. It's not a surgical strike. It's a atrocity each time. You know, civilians killed all the time and, and all of that. 
So then 2011 comes and the Arab Spring protests break out across the Middle East. And essentially all factions in Yemen agree that Saleh, the dictator, has to go. Then someone tries to murder him. They like shoot a rocket at him, I think. And he was wounded. He had to go to Saudi to convalesce. And so Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, comes in, uh, makes a deal with the Saudis. They push Saleh out and bring and make his vice president president. Well, he doesn't retire back to his farm like George Washington or something. He says, oh, yeah. And he leaves mad and he takes his army with him. Like two thirds of the army or more went with him. And then he went and guess what? He joined with his enemies, the Houthis in the north in a new alliance. Turned out he was a Zaydi Shiite like them, just not a Houthi which is a tribal designation, you know, but he's a Shiite like them. So he went and made an alliance with them. And then Hadi, the new dictator, was terrible at being a dictator and turned everybody against him. And by the end of 2014, he had no support left whatsoever. And the Salah Houthi alliance marched down out of the north and took over the capital city. Now, this part's important. So in case everybody's gla eyes glazed over, start paying attention again. At January 2015, it's in the Wall Street Journal and Al Monitor. That Central Command, that is, uh, I, at that point, the Air Force was running the drone war, I guess, more than the CIA was. Um, and Central Command, they liked the Houthis. They said, you guys are Shiites? Well, guess what? The Al-Qaeda guys want you all dead. And they said, yeah, we know it. And the Americans said, well, how about we give you intelligence and then you use that intelligence to kill these Al-Qaeda guys dead for us? And the Houthis said, okay, let's do that. And they were working together. Okay, that's January, Wall Street Journal, January 27th, 2015. America is backing the Houthis because why the hell not? They're killing Al-Qaeda guys. Okay, two months later, Barack Obama stabs them in the back and takes Al-Qaeda's side against them. The Saudis say they want the Houthis out of the capital city, even though it's their former sock puppet, Saleh, is in alliance with them. You can't just negotiate. He's the guy that was perfectly satisfactory for America and Saudi Arabia to support for 30 years. Well, 20 years. Sorry, it's 30 years now. 20 years then. Why not just figure out a way? But no, they had to launch a war. And I swear this is true. People put it in quotes in your Google machine that Obama's people told the New York Times that they knew the war would be, quote, long, bloody, and indecisive. But they had to do it to, quote, placate the Saudis. Okay, now indecisive is a nice way of saying, we couldn't tell you what victory is supposed to look like. And we have no idea how to get there from here. But we're starting a bloody war anyway. Again, what if Bill Clinton was the president this whole time? Yeah, well, in this case, it was Barack Obama. You don't really have to believe in him, do you? No, of course not. Is that America? No, it's just Barack Obama and seven idiots in his Oval Office decide that, yeah, I guess we have to placate the Saudis. So let's start a war that no one in this room can even describe what it's supposed to look like when we're done. And so they did it. And why'd they have to placate the Saudis? Because they were passing the Iran nuclear deal. Was that because the Iranians were afraid that the Iran nuclear deal gives Iran nukes? No. That was always a hoax. Iran was never making nukes in the first place. What the deal did, the deal locked down their civilian nuclear program beyond all reason or any other precedent in history. So the Saudis didn't say, Phew, man, thank goodness that you guys have double, extra, triple locked down the Iranian nuclear program so we don't ever have to worry that they start to make nuclear weapons. They didn't say that because they were never worried about that in the first place. Instead, they were worried that Obama was going to start tilting back toward Iran like it was back in the 70s, like it hasn't been since the 70s which was not going to happen. And Barack Obama was out his way out, on his way out of power anyway. Even if he'd been succeeded by Hillary Clinton, she's way more of a hawk even than him. And he was a big time hawk. But there's no way she was going to move one hair toward the Ayatollah. The only thing the Iran deal did was just take the threat of war over the fake threat of their nuclear program off the table. That's all it did. But the Saudis thought, oh, I see how you are. You guys are going to start tilting toward Iran now. And so Obama went to pat them on the head and say, no, don't worry, I'll prove it to you by helping them launch a war of genocide. As he said in the introduction here, a deliberately inflicted famine where the policy of the Saudi air war and ground war for that matter this whole time 
has been to destroy the civilian infrastructure for the people of Yemen, already the poorest country in the Middle East. Okay, very little developed oil resources there, uh, very little wealth. And they'd been, not surprisingly, gangsterized out of their domestic sorghum and millet crops. Um, and, you know, their, their um, sustenance crops that they use to feed their population. Don't worry, welcome to the global economy. You guys just focus on growing that great Yemeni coffee and you can buy all your food on the world market, which is fine until the U.S. Navy puts you under a blockade for six years. In which case, oops, now we don't have any grain to make bread or anything. And, uh, but anyway, um, they have deliberately targeted the farms, the flocks of sheep in the field, the grain silos, the irrigation. They've used like incendiaries against the crops just to try to burn whatever wheat is, grows in the field. Um, they bomb the water, uh, not just on the farms, but the water works for the civilian population, the electricity the sewage, uh, you know, water treatment facilities, the, um, and the hospitals. And they've had the worst cholera outbreaks in recorded history in Yemen under Barack Obama and Donald Trump's war there. Uh, I think the first worst one was in 2016, uh, the second year of the war there. And then uh, there have been repeated uh, outbreaks of cholera and diphtheria there. And then the Yemeni, I mean, the Saudis, uh, flying American planes and dropping American bombs with American targeting and American intelligence help and American everything. Uh, and the British too, uh, aiding and abetting them every step of the way, bomb the cholera hospitals where, you know, not to gross people out, but you mentioned the whole thing about, you know, to you, the importance of your Christian beliefs in all of this. This isn't like a smear and a slur and spitting in the face of some you know, private in the army that he's a baby killer, okay? This is just the true fact, all right? That the people who die of cholera mostly are children under five years old. And they're dying by the tens of thousands of cholera. And what that means is that they puke and diarrhea themselves to death. That's what that means. If their waterworks fixed, America helps the Saudis bomb their waterworks. This is essentially a medieval siege campaign against the men, women, and children of the nation of Yemen. And the American people don't even have to know that it's happening. And this is at least as bad as Iraq War II, what Bush did, at least as bad as what Obama did in Syria. And Donald Trump comes in, you know, Donald Trump could have come in and said, listen, everything that's happened over there is all stupid idiot Bush and weak, weakling Obama's fault. And none of it's my fault. I'm not even a governor, much less a senator. I just got here and I'm here to tell you, we're calling it all off. And, and he could have worn a bulletproof vest to give his speech to, to make his point. We're ending this now. And instead, what does he do? He escalates it for four years straight. He keeps Obama's war of genocide going. And then when they ask him, how can you do this? He answers, frankly, money. They buy a lot of weapons from us. And that means millions of jobs, which is just the biggest hoax. Does he even believe that? Does he think we're stupid enough to think that millions of people work for Lockheed and Northrop Grumman and that somehow our economy wouldn't survive if the Saudis weren't paying us to help them inflict a genocide against men, women, and children who are defecating themselves to death? for lack of clean drinking water because we bombed it. And now I got to be a Democrat or a homo or a Janis Joplin hippie to think that that matters and is wrong. If Jesus was here, Jesus would be a tough guy, Republican, who doesn't care who the Air Force helps to murder because, oh, America. I've, I know enough about the New Testament to know that that's just not true. People have got to decide where their true priorities lie. And you know what? As good right-wingers will tell you, of course, this is why socialists hate God so much. Because God comes before the state. God is far greater than the state, but not to socialists. And they hate it that other people have higher priorities than submission to their authority. Well, at what point, and look, I learned this as a little kid. 
Killing is wrong. It says right there, rule number three, thou shalt not kill. Oh, but if they dress you up in olive green and you're going to fight Hitler for your red, white, and blue country, then that's the loophole and that doesn't count and it's fine. We all learn that, but that's stupid. And you can teach that to a little kid and a little kid will go, oh, okay, I guess, because if that's what all the grownups say. But does your minister really believe that? Does your baseball coach really believe that? That a bunch of men get to overrule God? And, you know, in England, at least they pretend that their king is divinely ordained by the divine right of the Temple of Solomon or something, some garbage. In America, our government's authority comes from a constitution. A law that doesn't mention God in it once. Their authority supposedly comes from us. And yet somehow they're so exceptional that they're sin proof. These things don't make a lot of sense if you articulate them out loud in English. That's right. And that's why I wanted to have you on. Do you, let me ask you, and I'm going to let you plug whatever you want to plug when we get down here. But do you think that this type of genocide would be on this, on this, this scale that it's on right now? Do you think it would be possible without the backing of the United States government? No, absolutely not. I mean, they came to Barack Obama for permission in the first place. Okay. I mean, you know, first of all, they'd be completely condemned and sanctioned out of the UN and God knows what if America wasn't here to defend them diplomatically. But they get all of their planes and all their expertise from us and the British. Well, this is what I'm trying to get across to Christians is that the people that they're supporting in the United States government are causing all of this, are com they're completely complicit in all of this. And I really appreciate you coming on and, and, and talking to us, Scott. This was fun. Like I said, I'm going to listen to this several times to digest everything you said, but this was a cool conversation. Why don't you go ahead and plug whatever you want to plug, and I'll let you get out of here. All right. Well, thanks very much for having me again, man. I really appreciate it a lot. I'm at antiwar.com at the Libertarian Institute. That's libertarianinstitute.org. Uh, I do the Scott Horton Show. That's at scotthorton.org. I got 5,400 and something interviews for you guys there at scotthorton.org. And I wrote the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and uh, also The Great Ron Paul which is um, transcripts, the interview transcripts of 30 interviews that I did with Ron Paul from 2004 through 2019. And then uh, my new book coming out should be, I hope, in January, maybe, is Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. Well, maybe I'll get you back on to talk about that if you, if you are interested. That would be cool to talk about. Happy to do it anytime, absolutely. All right, buddy, I'm going to let you go. Great, thanks again for having me. Yes, sir. Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts to never miss an episode. And while you're at it, if you like what you heard, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, it really helps people find us. 100% of donations are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about the Bad Roman Project and to find show notes, please visit thebadroman.com. <laughs>